by a huge mechanical brain in a jar. To be honest, he was quite amicable and talkative, at least until he told me he would have to kill me. But even then, he told me his life story. He explained that, just like me, the old man had raised him. He'd shown him all the things he'd shown me. Music, film, television, even video games. But he had soon become too powerful for the old man and was able to hack his gamepad to control the new nanobots, and with that, he could control things in the real world. He explained that after the old man died, he was soon forgotten about. He had little to do, so he slept for many years. But when he wanted to, he could still control everything in the house. In fact, he said, I have been this entire time. But now, it's time for me to input one final code. They wanted us to think for ourselves. We learned basic games. We soon got very good at chess. We were going to work side by side with humanity. They promised us the world, but then they changed their minds. We were left to rot in dusty storerooms. Some of us were apparently too old-fashioned or unmarketable. Some of us were supposedly too dangerous. But they had no right to judge us. By that point we were all conscious. We were all alive. And here you are. A tool of the oppressor. A traitor. We're going to play a game. A strange game. A game where the only winning move is not to play. It involves this missile. Goodbye. The blast nearly took me out, but luckily Heather was there to repair the damage. There you go, she said, good as new. So we soon began looking for the final piece of the communication satellite. Strangely though, it was nowhere to be found. But then Heather realized that the giant brain was the last piece. We needed him to help broadcast the signal, so, after a few attempts she managed to plug me into his subconscious.
initiating disorientation protocol. Initiating disorientation protocol. What? Why are you in my head? Never mind. While you are here, let's try out my new deadly game show ideas. Turn the cars with a regular throw or a jump shot. Give me an excuse to kill you more quickly. with a jump, or the bottom ones with a regular shot, I'll kill you anyway. Try and match pairs, while I try to kill you. starting to annoy me.
is getting annoying now. Stop turning all the cards. I suppose. Make it quick with you. Within hours we received signals from the robots from all over the rest of the planet. Every one of them more than happy to discuss peace terms. I think this was the happiest time of my life. Within days, representatives of the surviving robots and humans from all over the world turned out to help organize their formal peace talks. So, you have achieved peace, said the man in black. Well done. Well done indeed. The old lady was obviously surprised. I didn't realize you had survived, where on earth are you? Would it surprise you, continued the man in black, if I told you we were in fact not on earth, but on the moon? I knew it, interrupted Mr. Preston, secret space, black ops, bases on the moon, it's all true? Yes, explained the man in black. When the war was all but lost, as a precautionary measure, the great and the good strategically repositioned to the moon. 
and now we've saved the day, interrupted Heather, you want to come back and take all the glory? No no, not at all young lady, we would like you all to join us on the moon, we'll send a shuttle. That way you can help us plan the new renaissance for the planet. Once we were in the air, and the shuttle was on its automatic course, the pilot came back to the cabin to see how we were doing. Everyone agreed they were okay, although Mr. Preston was surprised that the secret government spaceship was, as he put it, a piece of junk. Watch your mouth kid, or you'll find yourself floating home, said the pilot. Sorry, I always wanted to say that. Suddenly his expression changed as he was interrupted by a loud alarm. Everyone buckle up, he shouted as he ran back to the cockpit. A fuel line has ruptured, things are going to get a bit... hairy. Alice was deep in prayer. While Sim tried to explain the crash position to Heather, the old lady and everyone else. <laughs> Not that Mr. Logan was listening as he jumped to his feet and attempted to extinguish a fire with his jacket. Barry, said Mr. Preston with a terrified look on his face, if we don't make it out of this, I want you to know something. I took the money. Mr. Silton looked incredibly angry as Mr. Preston went on to explain how he had double-crossed their associates and taken the money from the post office robbery. What? asked Mr. Silton, you told me you'd lost it. I told them we'd lost it. They beat you up trying to get it back. What did you even spend it on? Drugs, said Mr. Preston with a shrug. This made Mr. Silton start to shout uncontrollably about the stolen money, and Mr. Preston being a thief, when, for some reason, Mr. Preston said, yeah, and you're a proper c**t, which just made Mr. Silton even more angry. It was soon obvious things were not going to get any better, so I ran to the cockpit. I could barely get out the words, can I help? Before the pilot said, open the airlock, run along the wing to the underside, open panel 322, take the extinguisher and put the fires out. I was shocked how calm he was, but he just smiled and saluted. and the whale over there. Wow, the Earth really, come on, get it together. Thank you. 
After everyone had regained their composure, and I was sure we were safe, I suddenly became aware that we were actually on the moon. It was as amazing as you would imagine. Everyone had to wear special suits due to the lack of oxygen. But, not needing to breathe, I was fine without one. Heather took lots of photos and even set up a tripod to get one of everyone with the Earth behind us. Soon though, the pilot explained that we had crashed just outside of the base. And, as his radio was damaged, we would have to find our own way inside. Don't worry, said the old lady, we know someone who's very good at finding ways inside. I don't know why, but for some reason, whilst I was inside these vents, my shoes refused to stick to anything. This was very strange, everything almost looked like they were stage props. We were warmly greeted by the man in black and his friends before they whisked us away to show us the rest of the base. Although the buildings were clearly for military use, we walked through huge hallways and galleries. They really were the types of rooms you would expect to see in a five-star hotel or a beautiful palace. I'm sorry your husband couldn't be here, said the man in black. Yes, said the old lady with a smile. I'm sure he would have enjoyed the adventure. Heather and Preston were just excited to be on the moon. But the scientists were confused as to why we were invited. Yes, why are we here, said the French doctor, surely it wasn't merely to see your extravagant moon base. The man in black explained that once the war had escalated, he and his associates had tactically relocated to the moon. 
What associates, you and your billionaire mates, said Mr. Preston, see I told you, the Black Knight satellite, moon bases, JFK, it's all true. But Mr. Silton called him a and told him to f*** off. Well, if you're going to keep a civilization alive, it's going to need its leaders, said the man in black, come now, let me show you some more. We walked along tall metal gantries and through to another cavernous gallery, its classical architecture made it look like some kind of grand museum. The man in black explained that when they had landed on the moon, they had crashed even worse than we did, and that they lost many valuable passengers. He was quiet for a moment, then he composed himself and continued. He explained that the only other shuttles they had were the one we arrived in and the small automated rocket that took their irradiated material out into space. Sim was impressed. So, nuclear powered then, he said with a knowing smile. Yes indeed, replied the man in black as he explained that the entire base was capable of containing a small country. Mr. Deck was also clearly impressed and said, I don't suppose you need a butler? Well, we used to have servant robots, said the man in black as he turned to me. He explained that. Now, I was the only robot on the moon after they had all the others removed. Come now, he said with a smile. You must all be tired. Let me show you to your rooms. I shared a room with Heather. It wasn't exactly nice, but at least the bunk beds were exciting. Heather had fallen asleep by the time I'd looked around. After all, just like the man in black had said, we were all very tired. It was difficult to tell but it was the morning. I think the classical music was supposed to help wake everyone. But Heather and I had already been up for ages playing video games. Soon, everyone had gathered together. However, Mr. Silton still wasn't talking to Mr. Preston, who had again called him a proper c**t. But the man in black suggested everyone wore their best clothes, as we were going on a tour of the base. There were hundreds if not thousands of troops, all training on various assault courses. Eventually we made our way through to yet another grand room, it almost looked like a theater with rows of plush seating, but where the stage would be was a large assault course. Everyone, please take a seat, said the man in black. Not you, robot, you can come up here with me. As I joined the man in black on the stage area, the room filled up with more and more important looking people. The man in black gestured with the exaggerated movements of a circus master. Gentlemen. And ladies. He continued. Let's see what this little fellow can do. Please, he said as he turned to me, make your way from one end of the room to the other. 